Today we're making anisole, which is a somewhat nice smelling organic liquid. Anisole itself doesn't have many direct applications, and it's mostly used as a precursor to perfumes and pharmaceuticals. I plan to use the anisole to make something called anethole, which is 13 times sweeter than regular sugar. The reaction that we'll be doing to make the anisole is called the Williamson ether synthesis, and I'll cover the mechanism later on in the video. In terms of chemicals, we have four major reagents. Sodium metal, methyl iodide, phenol, and methanol. We'll also need some sodium hydroxide, some dry calcium chloride, and some dichloromethane for the workup. To start things off, I added 150 milliliters of dry methanol to a round bottom flask. Once I'm done adding the methanol, I then move on to preparing the sodium metal. Before the sodium metal can be used, we first have to clean off the mineral oil that it was stored in, and then we have to chop it up into smaller pieces. Using a knife, I took out a reasonably sized chunk, and I tried to wipe away as much oil as I could using a paper towel. When I felt like most of the oil had been removed, I dropped the sodium into a beaker. I fill the beaker with toluene until the sodium is covered. Mineral oil is soluble in toluene, so this is just an added step to get rid of as much of the oil as possible. Using my very rusted knife, I try to agitate things as best as I can. After something like a minute, I felt like it had been washed decently enough, so I took it out and placed it on some paper towel. Now for the slightly more fun part, where we get to cut the sodium, and weigh out about 8 grams. Using my knife, I cut away some moderately sized pieces, and I place them on the scale. The freshly cut sodium is nice and silver, but it very quickly tarnishes. Once about 8 grams are weighed out, I put the sodium to the side, and remove the scale. The sodium metal that's left over that we don't need, is placed back under mineral oil for storage. Coming back to the round bottom flask with the methanol in it, I go ahead and dump in all of the sodium. You can see that the sodium reacts quite vigorously immediately after being added. The reaction is going to heat the methanol to its boiling point, and a lot is going to boil off, so it's very important to have a high efficiency condenser. This means that you should absolutely not use a Leibig or a Graham, and you really need to use something like a Dimroth or a Friedrich style condenser. On top of this, the water in the condenser should be ice cold, and you shouldn't use tap water or room temperature water. I didn't film it, but just for you guys, I tried to see if I could get away using a Leibig with ice cold water. The answer that I got was kind of, because I mean it works as long as you don't mind methanol splashing everywhere and flying out the top of your condenser. Anyway, what we're doing here is reacting the sodium with the methanol to form sodium methoxide and hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas bubbles away, and this leaves us with just sodium methoxide, which dissolves into the methanol. After several minutes, everything should be done reacting. This methanol solution is still pretty hot, so we let it stand until it cools down to below 50 C. As we wait for our methanol solution to cool down, we can warm up our phenol. Phenol is a solid at room temperature, but it melts at around 40 to 41 C. This melting step is optional, and it just makes it easier for us to add the phenol to the reaction mixture. It's pretty easy to melt it just using hot water, but this wasn't going fast enough for me, so I decided to use a heat gun. The heat gun is effectively just a really hot and heavy duty hair dryer, so if you have a hair dryer, you could use this instead. It only takes a few minutes of blasting the phenol with the heat gun to be left with a nice clear liquid. When I come back to the apparatus, the temperature is below 50, so I go ahead and add the phenol. All 32 grams of the phenol was added in at once. You can see here that by melting the phenol, it was a lot easier to add because we simply had to pour it, and it dissolves much quicker in the methanol. I stirred the solution for several minutes, and I waited for it to cool down below around 40 C. The stopper is removed, and it's replaced by an addition funnel, and to the addition funnel I add 50 grams of methyl iodide. 
The addition funnel is opened, and I start to add the methyl iodide. In the video made by ChemPlayer, the temperature went up to around 70C, but for me, I didn't really have any huge temperature increase. I'm honestly not exactly sure why ChemPlayer's temperature went up and mine didn't, but if you guys have any ideas, I would love to hear them in the comments. After all of the methyl iodide had been added, I place a heating mantle below the flask, and I bring things to a boil. As I mentioned earlier, the reaction that we're carrying out is called the Williamson ether synthesis. We're reacting phenol with methyl iodide in the presence of sodium methoxide and methanol to form anisole and sodium iodide. We started out by reacting sodium with methanol to produce sodium methoxide. Sodium methoxide is a strong base, and it deprotonates the phenol when it's added to form sodium phenoxide and methanol. The sodium phenoxide is the active species that will react with the methyl iodide once we add it. With some of the other common halogens like chlorine or fluorine, the carbon-halogen bond is polarized due to electronegativity differences. However, this isn't the case with iodine because the electronegativity of iodine is almost the same as carbon. The carbon-iodine bond is considered nonpolar, but it can still react as though it were polarized. I re-uploaded this video because of a mistake that was pointed out to me by Dylan Leary. I mistakenly said that the carbon-iodine bond is polarized, and here's his explanation as to why that's wrong. Effectively, the carbon-iodine bond is nonpolar, but we can pretty easily induce a polarization. If an electron-rich species approaches the carbon-iodine bond, the bond will tend to polarize, and the electrons in the bond will be pushed towards the iodine. This induces a partial positive on the carbon, and a partial negative on the iodine. In our case, the electron-rich species is the sodium phenoxide, and it's acting as a nucleophile. As the phenoxide approaches the methyl iodide in solution, the bond will become polarized, and the free electrons in the phenoxide will attack the partial positive of the carbon. A bond between the oxygen and the carbon will form at the same time that the carbon-iodine bond is broken. This forms our final anisole product, as well as sodium iodide as a side product. The Williamson ether synthesis is a nucleophilic substitution reaction, and it follows the SN2 type mechanism. If you want to know more about nucleophilic substitution reactions, or what SN2 is, I've provided a link to another video where I cover it in more detail. Once I hit the hour and a half mark, I then set things up for a simple distillation. Our goal here is to distill off the methanol, and because we're going to be distilling to more or less dryness, it's important not to crank the heat up too much. Eventually, most of the methanol is gone, and we're left with a nice cake at the bottom of the flask. What we have left here is mostly sodium iodide salt, as well as our product anisole. I allowed it to cool down a little bit, and then I added 100 milliliters of water. The density of anisole is less than that of water, so as I add the water, you can see the anisole floating to the top. The salt at the bottom is pretty tough, so I use a metal spatula to break it up into pieces. Once I break up the cake at the bottom, my stir bar starts to work again, so I turn on the stirring, and I let things mix until all of the salt has dissolved. Once all the sodium iodide had dissolved, I turned off the stirring, and we can see that things separate into two different layers. As I said before, anisole is less dense than water, so the upper layer here is our desired product. Before moving on, I take out the thermometer, and I rinse it with a little bit of water. Everything is then poured into a separatory funnel. The round bottom flask is washed with about 50 milliliters of water, and this is also added to the separatory funnel. The lower aqueous layer is drained into a beaker, and it's momentarily placed on the side. The upper layer, which should be almost entirely anisole, is poured into another beaker. The separatory funnel is placed back on the stand, and I pour the aqueous layer back in. I then add 50 milliliters of dichloromethane. 
Anisole is practically insoluble in water, but some of it either still dissolves or just floats around in suspension. Anisole is soluble in DCM, so with this washing step, we're able to pull any anisole that might have been left behind. As usual with a separatory funnel, we cap, shake, and vent it to get a thorough mixing, and we place it back on the stand for the layers to separate. In the meantime, while we wait for the layers to separate, I prepared a cold solution of 10 grams of sodium hydroxide in 50 milliliters of water. This preparation was pretty easy, where in the first step I dissolved the sodium hydroxide into the water, and once everything was dissolved, I dropped in a few ice cubes. Now we come back to the separatory funnel and the layers have separated, so I carefully removed the lower DCM layer. The DCM washing that I drained here was combined with the anisole that I collected earlier. We still keep the upper aqueous layer because we're going to do a little bit of recycling at the end. I cleaned the separatory funnel and then I poured in my DCM anisole mixture. I then add in the ice cold sodium hydroxide solution that I made about a minute ago. The separatory funnel is capped, shaken and vented and placed back on the stand for the layers to separate. The sodium hydroxide solution is supposed to react with any iodine that's present and convert it to sodium iodide. Small amounts of iodine in solution will give it a yellow color, but sodium iodide is colorless. So in theory here, after shaking it with the sodium hydroxide, we should be left with a colorless solution, but it's clearly still a little bit yellow. I think the yellow color is due to impurities that were left over from the dirty phenol that I used. Once the layers have separated, I drain off the lower DCM layer, and I dispose of the upper basic aqueous layer. Again, the separatory funnel is cleaned, and I pour back in the anisole DCM solution. On top of this, we add in 50 milliliters of water. The purpose of this step is to wash out any phenol that still might be left behind. Phenol is much more soluble in water than it is DCM, so it should migrate to the water layer. After the layers have separated, the lower DCM layer is drained into a beaker. The DCM layer here is a little bit cloudy due to the presence of water. In order to clear things up and to dry the DCM, we add in a little bit of calcium chloride. After mixing it around a little bit, we can see that the cloudiness slowly fades. I let it sit for something like 20 or 30 minutes, and when I come back, I'm left with a very clear solution. The calcium chloride is separated by filtering the solution through a little bit of paper towel at the bottom of a funnel. Under ideal conditions, I would have filtered it through some cotton, but I didn't have any on hand, so I had to use paper towel. After everything was filtered through, I washed the calcium chloride that remained with a little bit of fresh DCM. I removed the funnel, and then I dropped a stir bar into the flask. I set things up for a simple distillation, and I quickly removed the dichloromethane. I filled the flask here quite high, so it's important to be careful and to make sure that things don't boil over. The DCM stops coming over above around 40C, but I kept collecting everything up until about 130C. When I reached this point, I turned off the heat, and I swapped out the receiving flask. I turned on the heating again, and the anisole came over between 146 and 154 C. This boiling range is honestly pretty big, and it means that the anisole we're collecting here isn't super pure. To get more pure anisole, I would have to do a second distillation, and I wouldn't do a simple one, I would probably do a fractional. The distillation was stopped when there was a very small amount left in the flask. When we take a look at our receiving flask, we have some very nice and crystal clear anisole. The final yield of anisole was 20.1 grams, which corresponds to a percent yield of around 55%. This yield isn't exceptional, but 20 grams of anisole is much more than I need. My yield is very close to that of chem players, so I can reasonably assume that the efficiency of this reaction is somewhere around the 50% mark. As I said before, I'm going to be using it to make anethole, and I will get on that eventually. 
I mentioned earlier that we would recycle the aqueous waste, and that's what I'm going to do now. A major side product of the reaction was sodium iodide, and we can actually recover the iodine from this. Initially, it's pretty concentrated though, so the first thing that I do is I dilute it with an equal amount of water. I go ahead and test the pH, and I see that it's somewhere between 10 and 11. This solution contains leftover sodium methoxide and sodium hydroxide, so I'm honestly surprised that it's not more alkaline. What I do now is I keep adding concentrated hydrochloric acid and testing the pH until we get to a nice pH of around 1. After we achieved a pH of 1, I dumped in 200 milliliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide. There's a very quick and evident color change, and we can actually see purple iodine vapors coming off. As I waited for things to finish reacting, I covered the top with some plastic wrap to block the iodine vapors. I let things sit for about an hour, and when I came back, I saw that a lot of the iodine had floated to the top. Using a vacuum filter, I separated the iodine from the water. I washed the iodine a few times with water, and then a couple times with a very small amount of methanol. After the washing steps, I kept the vacuum on to try to dry it up as much as possible. The filtrate that came through still had some iodine in it, so I neutralized things with some sodium hydroxide. What remained in this flask was poured into a basic waste container. In the previous video, I had you guys guess what was in the bag here. I didn't think it was super obvious, but someone was able to guess it almost right away. On YouTube, the first person to answer it right was I forgot already, but there was a few other people who answered very quickly afterwards. I'll include them here as honorable mentions, but unfortunately, I'll only be giving the first person the reward. I released the video 24 hours in advance on Patreon, so I'm going to provide a separate reward for people who guess there. On Patreon, the first person to guess right was Carl Bright. For the reward, I was originally going to give you guys something digital, but I've decided to send you a Nile Red branded beaker. I'm supposed to get some samples shipped to me in the next week or so, so when I get them, I'll ship them out to you guys. When the time comes to send them out, I'll just need your address, and I'll cover everything including the shipping, it won't cost you guys anything. I've decided that I want to interact more with you guys, so at the end of each video, I'm going to start leaving a question. For those of you who decide to answer the question, I'll feature the person who had the best answer in the next video. I'll also send you a beaker or something else if you want. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to synthesize anethol from anisole, and this is a pathway that I found on Google after like 2 seconds of searching. This question might be a little bit difficult, but I want you guys to suggest a mechanism for the first step of this reaction. Whoever's first to give what I think is a good answer will be the winner. As usual, I'd like to thank everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. Everyone who supports me with $5 or more will get their name at the end like you see here. I know I've been saying it forever, but I really am trying to work on other tier rewards and to add more rewards to the $1 and $5 levels. Anyway, these are the videos that I've filmed and the ones that I plan to film. If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments.